Hey, everyone, and welcome to this Thursday's release of the podcast, where we're talking about the impacts of distance on our parent projects. Like always, today's show will speak to many, but it's specifically oriented to family, friends, and professional advocates of the age who are stepping into leadership positions of a downsizing project for another. We're going to take a look at how to research, uh, how to have conversations, and how to follow up and particularly long-term and emergency uh, length plans for managing your parents. In general, we kind of wrap this up as a tips, tricks, and ideas for managing these situations for afar. Overall, there's some great information on how to approach, monitor, and address a range of distance-related issues for your parent project. So I hope you guys enjoy our content today. You're listening to Parent Projects, a Senior Moves podcast production. Now here's your host, Tony Sievers. Welcome, everybody. And this week, I just uh, a good note, we've got Luis Marquez on with us, our business operations manager. Luis, thanks for joining us today and bringing some information to light and making it real. Of course. Yeah, no, I this topic really kind of hits home right now, especially that I'm living in Arizona right now, my parents are back in Oregon. So it's very interesting topic for me. And today we're going to break down the topics into three segments, how to research and prepare uh, for conversations and, and management of a situation from a distance, uh, the conversations that you, you could have and should have. And then we're going to work through different follow-up from emergency planning, how to stay connected, uh, and some uh, open openness and transparency tips and tricks to work through. Uh, but uh, before we jump into those, Luis, you've got a couple of news stories out of our e-magazine parent projects that you wanted to uh, that we, we wanted to integrate. We talked about integrating. Can you uh, share those with the audience and and get them set up? Yeah. So we have um, one of the articles is six tips for long distance caregiving, and that was from WhereYouLiveMatters.org. Um, interesting article and aging parents from a distance who aren't really just fine. And that one's from usnews.com with the staff writer, Lisa Esposito. Wonderful. And we're going to integrate both of those stories into our conversation points today. So if you haven't already subscribed or aren't a member of Senior Moves, make sure you head over to seniormoves.org because our e-magazine is a a member content uh, where you can find these articles and, and a lot more. And with that, you know, Luis, let's let's really jump into this first segment uh, in dealing with researching and preparing for how to tackle your your parents from a distance. You're you're at a distance from your parents, just like I am. In fact, we we have a similar thing, right? Our parents are back in Oregon while we're out here. What's that? What sits on your mind uh, most heavily being away from your parents right now? Well, I mean, being the oldest of, um, so I'm one of the oldest of five siblings. And um, honestly, I've been not to, you know, put any shame on my siblings, but I mean, as the oldest, I've taken that position of like taking care of my parents, um, doctor's appointments and um, anything that has to do with like bills and stuff like that. Usually it was, it's me and my older sister, I mean, well, not my older sister, but my, my younger sister. Um, and being in a different state now, it's like, now I have to kind of like, okay, I'm in a different state. My parents are back in Oregon. And now I got to like plan, like what happens if something goes wrong? Like, do I need to leave and fly back to Oregon or um, also just kind of step back and let my siblings also take part of that now and, and, and maybe not be so controlling and, 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 you know, like an assist. Yeah. And being that person for so long, um, it's a, a little harder and reading through these articles and, 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 and preparing for this, um, it got me thinking a lot. Yeah. Well, there is a, a key thing to kick off. It's something, it seems that many of the families that we interact with and have helped uh, when we were doing project management with families one-on-one, as well as families that since then, uh, is, is how to keep a realistic expectation of what you can and can't do. So I think one of the, the 
critical elements of researching and preparing for 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 taking on a, a role of a of a you know of a parent project is being real in your evaluation right what your skill sets are if you if you move uh, then you probably need to do a reassessment from where you're at I know, especially once we get into talking about the emergency planning later in the episode, that is something that very clearly comes into play. But uh, yeah, in evaluating what's realistic for, for you particularly, chances are, if you're listening to this podcast, this listener is, you're likely the person who stepped up like Luis has and will step up uh, in the case of a situation or are stepping up now for your parent project. a key place we like to start all projects is this idea of goal orientation. When we get into goal oriented, one of the key things that we talk with people about is uh, the confused mind says no. And uh, the, another great saying that wraps around that is that when people know why, they can deal with a heck of a lot of how. So when crafting a why around a goal for your aged loved one or the person that you're working for, uh, something that they want to accomplish becomes a great way to come back to things that can indeed be done. Uh, and if you've set that on top of your planning and then start evaluating what you can do towards that goal, now I think you're moving in a much better way to research, which uh, then leads you into exploring different options. Have you and your siblings, Luis, have you had conversations of, of different type of options, what may happen long-term or, or where you may go for, uh, to help your parents accomplish what they want to in retirement? Not really in, again, we, we haven't gotten to the conversation just because it just seems so far away. But now, like, kind of doing the work that we're doing here, it gets me thinking, and it's conversations that we need to start having, and just setting goals is like, hey, where do we, what do we want to see, where do we want to see our parents in, you know, three years? Like, what are, what are those goals? And um, I mean, we've gotten goals to the sense of like, when I moved over here, it's like, hey, what are the goals that we want? Like, if I'm moving, I'm leaving, you know, who's gonna do what? What's gonna happen? Um, we've gotten that far, but like thinking like retirement and, and plans and stuff like that, we really haven't sat down and talked about it. And, you know, that's something that I think soon, you know, maybe the next time I go back um, and visit Oregon and really just sit down and be like, Hey, what is the plan? What are our, what, what are our goals? Not just for my, our parents, but how is that going to affect us in our life too? Because, you know, we're all now creating different lives with, with, wives and husbands and kids and stuff. And life is just going to get crazier. C completely. And what is the best time? When is the most likely time that you're, you and your family are going to have a conversation about something like this? I think that is just kind of making it happen. I mean, we, we all lived in the same town, um, super not from far from each other until I moved to Arizona. But now it's kind of like next time I go in there, which hopefully will be um, Thanksgiving um, and just really sit down or even have a, a phone conversation to start the conversation. Like, Hey, have we thought about like, what is in three years? Where, where are we going to be at? Like is, my dad's going to retire pretty soon um, or right around the corner. What is that going to look like? You know, what, is, what, what is their living style going to be? How are we going to be able to help and how are we preparing for it? Right. But maybe, um, maybe, just starting the conversation over the phone and just really sit setting aside time to sit down and be like, Hey, we've talked about this on the phone. Like, let's get, let's get talking and seeing what we're going to do uh, and, for the future. And that's great. Family, family meetings. I love hearing how much you talk about the getting other family members involved and just that aspect of it. It kind of takes, when you're able to plan ahead, it kind of takes a lot of the, not a lot, but it takes a significant amount of the emotion out of it when you're not responding to a situation or how somebody, what action a sibling did take and everybody's trying to unpack it and rework through that. Uh, so that proactive, that proactivity is great. One thing we talk with people about is typically it's going to be when you're doing that planning, it happens to be holidays. It seems to be one of the, the, the earliest opportunities or the big opportunities that family members start discussing stuff where they go to see it. 
but uh, it's, it's, we do stress it's, it's important to try to plan your conversations uh, around holidays, not, not during a holiday, but at a different time. And there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, number one, the conversation should happen in person, uh, especially when you want to really get an evaluation and where your parent project uh, the co- how complicated your parent project is going to be. You need to see what's what. And that's a very difficult thing to get an understanding of just from the phone. Uh, you also need to reduce assumptions that are happening. And, uh, you know, those assumptions, uh, they say first reports are always wrong, uh, or at least usually wrong. Uh, and assumptions are a key way that we get ourselves in trouble with all types of relationships in our life. Uh, this is a huge one we've, t- we've talked about before and we'll continue to talk about. Uh, typically, an adult child's assumptions about what their parents are doing or why they're doing it is based off of their experience of the first, you know, 17 or 18 years of their life, uh, and their view of their parents were whatever view their parents allowed them to see because their parents want their kids to see the best yeah. version of themselves. So those, uh, so our assumptions are typically built off of sometimes a false narrative. Uh, the best version of that and not necessarily the most accurate. And particularly after 20, 30, 40, 50 years has gone by, your parents have continued to evolve. So getting there in person, seeing what those things are, there's nothing like seeing uh, and anticipating and understanding driving habits uh, other than seeing driving habits and what that looks like and looking at the vehicle and seeing how comfortable getting to ask them questions in a non-threatening way. Hey, how, how, how comfortable do you feel driving mom or Hey, hey, Dad, uh, where are there places you don't like to drive to anymore uh, to, to find out and to start getting a synergy uh, or some type of pattern around things that they're looking to avoid? Yeah, I'd also say in the, the planning, planning your visit is extremely important. And a lot of people are looking for for what to do when you do hit that visit. So going back to the family meetings uh, or the visits, staging during or having the conversation or trying to do an evaluation during a, a time where everyone's expecting to be there kind of allows everyone to be on their best behavior. Mm-hmm. And, and if you think about Christmas, you know, think in your own home is what happens on your house on Christmas day or Thanksgiving day, the best representation of what Monday, September 9th feels like to you. Uh, chances are it's not right. Uh, and so planning that and thinking about that, um, in your visits, planning ahead, here's a couple of of quick tips. We talked about driving already. Uh, take a look at laundry and how that looks. Take a look. Uh, is it caught up? Can they stay up with where it is? Are they washing things that are clean? Um, mail in general to figure out how that's going. Uh, are they opening mail? Is it, what type of mail is coming in? Uh, that was a big thing for me that saw that we had a problem. I recognized uh, right away that uh, we had multiple not-for-profit organizations that, rec- that, that recognized and cited in on my grandmother that she would write him a check or uh, God help us. She, I mean, opened a credit card to continue giving them money. Uh, oh, wow. And they, yeah, they just, they just ate her up. So you know, pay, paying a little attention to that. One way to, to look at that activity are those ADLs, uh, activities of daily living. Uh, and there's a, there's a great explainer uh, in, on seniormoves.org. Uh, but the, they give you the, the basic activities. And if you can walk yourself through those in monitoring and giving yourself the best opportunity to, uh, to view people going, your family members going through it. That's the best way to go. Uh, so that, that hopefully that gives you kind of a baseline of, of what to look at, uh, how to prep for that ahead of time in your visit, plan your visit out to do that at the right timing, involve other family members. Um, hey, Luis, do you have, you know, now that you're gone, uh, is, do you have a particular family member that is, is better in touch with maybe medical issues with your family? We're all very, we're all very in tune with what's going on with our parents. Um, I always kind of go with, with my sister. So she's the second oldest, but just because if, and, and also culture um, is, takes a big part in, in, in this situation. In our culture is we're talking about like, you know, 
parents are like, you know, they're going to either live with you or you were taking care of them. You know, they took care of us, you know, and we're very like family oriented. So Mm -hmm. all five of us are in tune. If something happens to, you know, recently, a couple of years ago, my mom broke her leg. Um, She fell, she broke her leg and we have a, you know, we had a, a group chat and we're texting and like, Hey, what's going on? What's the update? So we're all like very in tune, but it's always either me or my my sister, which is the son, uh, second oldest, who who really knows the medical, you know, what's going on. And then the rest of their siblings are there to support us. Like, okay, well, how's it going on? Let me know if you need something. If we can't drive them to an appointment, they're going to make the time, um, which is great because communic- we're communicating openly. We have to. And yeah. I think that, you know, going into, you know, conversations like, is there is the the mail the laundry sometimes we just have to have an open conversation with our parents and be like hey what's going on right you know and right. opening that up is gonna it's it's what really helped us i know that i had to have that conversation with my dad with uh financial stuff my dad is really like oh i'm you know he pays the bills he we don't i don't you know i don't need to know anything about his financial stuff but we're in the shift where hey now i'm getting older you're you know you're getting older we need to openly and be like hey i'm leaving to a different state i need to make sure that you're taken care of before i can make this leap and right. we, well, we have to make that um, conversation just openly doing so with multiple injects or having other family members while one family member uh, might not be the go-to all the time on that particular item. That might be someone that mom or dad has a, has talked to about the situation or expect uh, you know transparently expressed their thoughts behind that. Uh, and so when you're able to work with your siblings uh, and other family members or close friends and relatives, uh, that can go a long way when we go into yeah. this last segment, which is really that follow-up. Uh, because especially if you're working on an assumption. Uh, going back to defeating those assumptions, a great way to do that is to draw on perspective of other family members or other people that are close to um, to the age person yeah. that you're working. And with. it's just and it's the support. I mean, going. Uh-huh. I mean, away from my parents and stuff. Like my grandma passed seven years ago, but we went through a harsh like medical history with her, and my mom was the one that like knew from beginning to end what medication she needed, what everything she. Uh, the times that she took them, what doctor appointments and stuff. And sometimes we had to leave on vacation and had to go deal with, you know, other family I- events and the, uh, my mom's other siblings had to take care of them, um, take care of my grandma. So my mom was always that resource, like, Hey, but we had a plan with her where my mom had written everything down the pills that she took at 7am at 12 at three at eight and the instructions And that was very helpful. And it goes again, you know, with the open communication and really just having not just one person know what's going on, but having, you know, a little bit, you know, two, three more people knowing exactly what the the plan is, um, because that helped a lot because my mom could easily left to, you know, on a trip and knowing that my my grandma was going to be okay with someone else and her medication, if something went wrong. But in, in involving, you start talking to those medication things and your mom stepped into that role. I know for a lot of our members, uh, they're going to not have that necessarily that relationship because maybe they live too far, don't have a sibling that's right there. So let's give them a couple of, of tips on some people that they could reach out to that might be able to help them stay connected, which in follow-up, staying connected, having emergency plan, and at the same time, um, communicating openly and transparently. Those are those, those, those key factors in staying connected. Uh, let's talk through, uh, people. So Luis, if, if I don't have a family member that can drop in or stay, uh, who, who could your family, who do you think a family could, could turn to or ask about? I think neighbors are going to be your number one because yeah. your neighbors, I'm not, I'm not going to say that they see each other every day, but I mean, they're observing you know, they're going to at some point every single day, they're going to see your face or they're going to see your parents face um, at some point. But I would definitely suggest, um, you know, neighbors uh, would be your your number one. I think yeah, I think you're right. I, I think it's imperative that, you know, uh, the neighbors, if you have that opportunity to know uh, also, you know, friends of at, at church or those key friends 
and relationships that your family uh, or that they have uh, and being able to know how to how to check in with them and how they can check in with you if they recognize things. Uh, those I, I think that's absolutely key in, in staying connected, uh, doing so in a transparent way. You know, one in a, thing in a, in a simple tra- um, well, um, so, sometimes I know it's difficult here also is that maybe you don't know your neighbors. You know, but right. at some at some point, you know, you have to just do an introduction. I mean, we have before and my parents have a neighbor that lives right in front of the house and it was two elderly, you know, uh, people, you know, amazing people. And um, his wife passed away. And then after that, he was still living by himself there. And we really didn't interact with them. We were just kind of like the new neighbors. But then we started seeing like him leaving the garage open all night and then right, you know, the right. lights you know were turned off and, and he he was he ha- he was loss of hearing so we had to make that connection with the with the with the his daughter um and was like hey can you give us your number just in case something happens you know like we can get a hold of you and it's just making that introduction because sometimes you just need to you know? Absolutely. In, in, the, in the U.S. News article, uh, Sandy Mark, who was the CEO of the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, which there's a series of regions of those across the country, if you're not familiar with them, uh, where we are, happen to be in, in Region 1 here in Arizona. Uh, he talks about transportation really being a huge tell and a huge issue for seniors. They need that to get around. They need mm-hmm. uh, it, It's a great indicator of trouble. And I got to tell you, there's nobody watches transportation, both young and old, like neighbors in, yeah. in a neighborhood who are <laughs> paying attention to how cars are moving up and down the neighborhood. And they will have no problem letting you know if there's property damage or something happening. Yeah. So yeah, neighbors are a great one. You know, and one of the key concepts to, to, I think, always put forward is, you again, transparency works both ways. You want your family member, you want the aged person that you're working for to be very transparent with you about what's going on, but they have to feel like you're not trying to get them or working around them. And so one thing that that seems very, very um, beneficial is getting them to see you as a resource that prolongs their uh, their, their independence instead of somebody who's looking to challenge their independence. Yeah. And so if you're, if you're constantly asking those questions and approaching conversations from an aspect of, Hey, what resources can I bring to you that would enable this to happen or to keep you working through this thing? One, they're going to help, they're going to help themselves. And you're probably going to find more better resources searching from that perspective online, talking to people and organizations, than you will, uh, from the perspective of, man, I have this big thing to take care of and it just sucks and, and it's on my shoulders and how do I deal with it as little as possible? Um, I, I think you'll, you'll find that you get to be more transparent to them just as they can be more transparent to you and that will keep the relationship going. Yeah. Uh, one, one of those ways that you help keep them on board and one of the earliest ways uh, that's talked about in one of the articles is a caregiver. Having somebody, you know, drop in and, you know, if, if you know, your, your family member or whomever you're working with was in the hospital stay or, or maybe they just had a quick doctor's visit, it wasn't going well, or they're starting to, you're seeing some of those ADL slip, having someone come into the home that, that can prolong their independence yeah. and shore them up and you being the person that helps bring that person to bear, uh, that's a tough conversation. Uh, there is a way to uh, to approach that from a, let's keep you in charge of you longer. Uh, but it is a slippery slope. I have no, uh, delusions about how difficult that is. I've watched many of our families, uh, struggle to have that conversation and avoid a parent immediately saying, oh, you're just trying to get somebody to come in and, and take yeah. things away from me. Yeah. That, that really, when you're hearing those comments, it speaks more to the uneasiness uh, and there's probably a new approach that needs to be looked at at the, at the highest level. Yeah. Um, so the last thing I, I really want to cover here is emergency planning. We, uh, you know, we had a great conversation uh, over lunch uh, earlier, Luis, that, that I really enjoyed with you on, uh, you know, both thinking through, three, you know, three different levels of a plan. Right. And in, uh, I'm a military emergency planner by, by trade before <laughs> I, I got into this. So one, one aspect I get to actually touch and bring into this 
is when doing your planning, recognizing you kind of need a 24 hour plan, a 72 hour plan and a two week plan. And they're very distinctive in, in what they can bring to you and why those might be a great starting point. The first, the 24 hour plan is usually smaller severity issues, right? They're your, your mom, you know, hits something and her car's got to go into the shop because the tires got to be fixed. And, and somebody's got to be able to cover down to, so that interruption to life is as little as possible, particularly if four days a week might be occupied with critical Thing, activities for them around aging, uh, healthcare appointments yeah. or, or, um, or the gym or other things that just keep their mental attitude in the game. So that 24 hour plan is, is, and that's probably a particular person who's going to be close that can do that pretty quickly. Like who can help uh, and, me within 24 hours that to be able to help my parents out basically. Right. 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 And then, and then that the 72 hour plan, that's kind of a different level of pain. The 72 hour plan is likely somebody who, and yeah, you, you can't plan Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I, I don't think that's fair. I think you have to plan it. <laughs> I think, honestly, I think you have to plan it like Sunday morning so that like nothing's open <laughs> all day <laughs> and Monday's a holiday. <laughs> and then you got oh, a gosh. Tuesday. <laughs> so think of it like last weekend, right? It happened last, sun, last Sunday morning at, at 5 a.m. and it's going to run. Uh, and that's the next 72 hours from there. Uh, so that's a, that's a level of a pain where somebody's going to have to be able to break away uh, and, and stay. That may be an overnight hospital visit, uh, something to that nature, where in 72 hours, if they have a pet or someone at home, usually that circumstance, someone's going to also have to step in, not only to keeping them in the game, but keeping the household and yeah. keeping the rest of their life uh, up to snuff so that they don't walk into a bigger problem than they, that they, than they got themselves into with whatever the situation was, uh, who's going to feed that animal, who's going to make sure the water got turned off and the stove got turned off with these different things there. So yeah. that's kind of that 72 hour plan. The, the two week plan is a, is the high, the, one of the, the next level of pain. And, and you, you could plan to the end of the world. The reality is generally I find that a two week plan is going to engage somebody who's going to have to travel. So, okay. and it's going to cover a shifting down of things. So we, this is what I appreciated with you. We talked about, you know, you, you don't have any kids uh, and where at first blush, I might think, oh, mom's going to need something for two weeks. You're the guy, you're going to get on an airplane. You're going to head up there. You can work from about anywhere and you do that. But you brought up the reality when we were talking might be that your sister's the best person to be with mom and you can backfill for your sister and whatever those yeah. things are, because they're, she might be the best person for that tenure of a, of a two week kind of plan, or uh, now you're rotating with her into a situation in and out back to her life. So don't just think of it as an all or nothing in the solution. Think about what tag team might look there. Yeah. Think about, yeah. Think about who's the best person to do what two weeks is probably going to impact an employer. And you're going to have to work around that type of a plan. Uh, two weeks is also long enough. You need to cover one of the, you know, the last thing I want to cover here are your travel options. Yeah. It, you know, Luis, you you fly home. Is that right? Most of the time, if you've got to go. Yeah. Uh, what are the surprised. other ways that you would? So, you know, we learned, we learned with my grandmother when COVID hit, literally we went within a, within a like four hour segment or a warning we went from my mom getting to spend every day of uh, every day of the week for four years with my grandmother to we had four hours to make one statement to her and then couldn't see her for over four and a half months oh, uh, and then that visit was very difficult uh you know behind masks and shields and and, and uh communication barriers and it was very confusing to her and she was scared and a lot of a lot of things were going on um, you know, that, that, that emergency plan of travel options, uh, is something that's critically important. So, uh, what well, you could, you have to plan for what happens if you can't fly, right? And are you gonna, I guess for you, you drive or train? I mean, I think that it would have to be, yeah, either driving or taking the train. Like, what are my other options? I mean, how about if I don't have the money to, to get an expensive, you know, uh, flight, 
and 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 you know maybe i need to drive maybe i need to take the train or it or there's other options maybe take the bus um but really thinking about it now as we were having this conversation i'm like hey my first choice is to fly but what if i can't fly <laughs> you know right. like what what are my what are my other options and i think people just having that conversation and having that in mind will just prepare you for anything that comes along the way yeah, absolutely. Well, and the, we used to have a bereavement fair, which was something you could really work through on, on most forms of transportation and public transportation. That is a very difficult thing to find today. Uh, and you find more often that people are rallying and trying to work through a collection of maybe airline miles and donation of airline miles to work something out if you're going to be flying across the country or, or something to that nature. So uh, thinking about those things ahead of time, I think are, are going to be pretty key for you. So yeah. any, uh, I mean, that, 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 that's a realm of stuff. Uh, we, we've covered kind of how to research and some tips and, tips and tricks there, uh, some conversations and how to prepare for it, making sure that you're having it in person, planning those visits well, involving your family members uh, in those conversations. And we've gone through that follow-up and emergency planning, how to stay connected, the importance of transparency and, um, and communicating openly um, uh, across this. Is there, Anything you, the else you think we sh- we can really draw out of these articles, uh, Luis? Um, one one thing I did, and we and we talked about it earlier, is about how often do we need to change these emergency plans? And you brought a really good point. Is it kind of just depends on what's going on with you know with with your life? Is it a major change? You know, like COVID, or is it something that you know a move, or is it something that maybe like for example, like me? you know, that plan would have changed as soon as I moved to Arizona. Who is going to be the main contact now? Who's going to, you know, be helping my parents out um, when I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be here. You know, I can't, I mean, I could be on the phone, but that's just going to be more difficult. Um, And how often do we need to change these um, emergency plans? And, you know, you did bring a good point on, on that is kind of just depends on what's going on. Maybe you don't need to change it for a long time, but maybe you need to be changing it constantly depending on what's going on. Great, great. Uh, a- absolutely appreciate that uh, a lot. And that is where we're going to leave you this week, everyone. So uh, those are your tips, tricks, and ideas in managing uh, f- the impacts of distance on your parent project. Uh, thanks for joining us. Luis, thanks for popping on. Uh, and as always, and supporting us there. Really appreciate you. Of course, it was awesome to, uh, getting to talk to you through this topic. Thank you. And that's it for the Senior Moves team this week. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoy the content, remember to subscribe to this podcast on that app that you're using right now. Reviews and comments, they help us help you by expanding our reach and our perspectives. So if you have time, please drop us a note and tell us how we're doing. For more tips and tools to get your parent project moving while maintaining dignity and downsizing, you can find us on YouTube, follow us on Facebook or Instagram, and join us at SeniorMoves.org. Thanks again for joining us this week, and we'll catch you next Thursday. Thank you for listening to this Senior Moves podcast production. To access our show notes, resources, or forums, go to SeniorMoves.org. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by Phoenician Partners LLC and Senior Moves. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcast.